We welcome you again to Burl Press. I'm Graham Baird, lead pastor. We're so grateful you're here today that you came out on this Sunday. We want to also say a special hi to everyone watching on live stream, but particularly to members of the church who are on the Princess Cruise right now, docked outside of Oakland. Our prayers are with you. Let us know if there's anything we can do for you, and we thank you so much for being a part of our service. We are on our second week of our series called Enough. Enough. Wow. Say it with me. Enough. Don't you just feel like you've just had enough? And that is a deeply spiritual word. We're going to look at that word throughout the entire season of Lent. We want to particularly encourage you to uh, say enough in four different ways. Uh, One way you could say enough is, I have enough of something, and therefore I will. In my case, it will be hats. Uh, My daughter will be horses, I mean miniature horses. Uh, You may say, I am enough. I am enough in God, and therefore I will. You might say during Lent, sometime leading up to Easter, I will say enough in some situation, and that is a spiritual sentence. Or you might finally say, you know, I've done enough. I've done enough. I've done all I can do, and that's spiritual too. So we're going to take a look at the word enough. Last week, I also revealed to you that I, four years ago, rented a football stadium on Easter, and only 100 people came to that service. So we thought this was as good a time as any to tell you where we're going to have our Easter service as a church. Uh, (laughs) Levi's Stadium, don't you think? We could probably get it for $5 at this point. Today, we're going to take a look at a word which we sometimes throw around, but it's the word contentment, contentment. We're going to see the connection between contentment and enoughness in Christ. But first, would you pray? Lord, we come to you after the end of a very interesting week in which we have had a national election, in which we have had many other things going on with both the scares in our world, in our own personal lives. We give you the next 20 minutes or so, Lord, to reflect deeply on your love for us as we offer these words, and I offer them to you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Many of you may know that since I have come as your pastor, we have not only done a whole bunch of cool things in the church, but I was also able to get uh, my doctoral degree. And thank you for the time to uh, allow me to do that. What what you may not know is what my doctorate is on, or frankly be interested in, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Uh, The official title is a homiletical model for helping people in new age ideologies become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. But really what I was looking at is the similarities and the differences between Christianity and Buddhism. So let me just uh, ask you a couple of questions to begin with. I'm going to throw out some words, and I want you to think about whether these are Buddhist words or Christian words. Let's, let's start with this one. The word is meditation. And you can, say, you can count up your score. There's five of these we're going to look at. Meditation. The second one is communion. Communion. Third word, wholeness. Wholeness. Fourth word, consciousness, consciousness. And finally, the fifth word, contentment, contentment. Now, I'll let you answer your own question, see what your score is, but if you answered that all five are Christian words, you got it right. Of course, they could also be Buddhist words, but they are Christian words. There are words, though, that we often might see at a TED Talk or we might see at a motivational talk, and we don't usually think about the words meditation or consciousness. That was a deeply reformed idea, conscience or wholeness, or the word we're going to look at today is contentment. Contentment is a very old Christian idea. It begins... uh, certainly in the Old Testament, but no author in the New Testament is more articulate about the concept of contentment than the Apostle Paul. He writes this letter we're going to look at today uh, to the Philippian church, which it must be said was one of the hardest churches Paul has ever pastored. 
You may remember in the book of Acts, we learn that uh, Paul starts that church outside the city near a river with a woman named Lydia. He then comes into the town, baptizes a couple of people, speaks in a synagogue, gets thrown out of the synagogue. The city council arrests him, beats him, and then throws him in jail. That's where you remember he is in jail with Silas. And then, if it wasn't bad enough, in jail, there's an earthquake that he has to experience. It's a very tough call, which is why it's very interesting that Paul begins his letter to the Philippian church with these words of deep encouragement. He says, I thank my God every time I remember you. He says, in all my prayers for you, I always pray with joy. He says, I have all of you in my heart. And finally, he says, therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. It's just dripping with optimism and hope. Where does this optimism and hope and positivity come from? It's interesting also to look at Paul's life. You might say that Paul lived two different lives. The first part of his life, you might say, was the life of plenty, I mean, he went to the best schools, he had the best zip code, he had a good house, his parents did pretty well, he had the best clothes, he had the best social setting, he had plenty. The second part of Paul's life, and the one that we look at in his ministry, is where he has a lot of trouble. He is in want. I mean, he is lacking almost every single day. Philippi wasn't even the toughest of the cities that Paul ministers to. And yet, in this text, we we learn the word contentment. So I want to reflect on this word and its connection to the concept of enough. Again, we're looking at Philippians chapter 4, and we're going to take a look at uh, verses 10 through 13. By the way, these Bibles are for you. They're in the pew. Listen for God's word. Paul begins this way, I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. If this sounds like a critique, it kind of is. It's what I would call compassionate critique. And my late grandma, God bless her soul, was very good at compassionate critique. Uh, You would call her up and you would say, Grandma, it's Graham. Oh, Graham, so good to hear from you. And then, why haven't you called me? compassionate critique. Here is his compassionate critique. I rejoice greatly in the Lord. Then finally, critique, at last you renewed your concern for me. Here's another compassionate critique. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. (laughs) Critique. But here's his focus on contentment. I'm not saying this because I am in need And we should reflect on the fact that Paul at this moment is under state and house arrest and the guard is watching over his every move. And yet he says he is not in need. I'm not saying this because I'm in need. And here's our focus for the morning. For I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. The word content in Greek is autarkes, autarkes. Would you say that with me? Autarkes. It's really a two-part word. The first part of the word is auto or self, and the second part of the word is arkes, which literally means sufficiency or I can do it. It's what I was trying to lift up with the kids in the children's sermon, when you can do something by yourself. What Paul is talking about is a kind of inner hope and joy, and peace that comes between you and God. Contentment, autarkes. And then Paul lifts up the recipe. How do we get this in all circumstances, no matter what is happening in our crazy world? He says this, I've learned the this, this secret. I'm, I've learned to be content, for I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of self-hope, self-joy, self-happiness 
in any and every situation, whether well-fed or whether hungry, whether living in plenty or living in want. So you see, Paul is setting up a dichotomy here. On the one hand, plenty, bounty, overflowing abundance. That was the first part of his life. He had everything he could ever want, everything he could ever imagine. And on the other hand, he lifts up want, lacking, being in deficit. Things aren't going great. Now, what's interesting here is Paul seems to be saying that the secret to contentment is not in either plenty or in want, which is a big idea for us. I mean, how many of us or how many people you know believe that if they just keep going and keep pushing and keep getting more, then they will be content? But Paul is saying that no, plenty will not buy you contentment. We live in such a binary world that this is a crazy idea in our modern context. We just had an election on Tuesday. See, it feels like a year ago, doesn't it? We had an election in our country, and if there was ever an election of a choice between plenty on one side, everything's going great, there are no problems in the country, everything's perfect, or want, nothing is going well, there's nothing good, and nothing is good in the world, want, it was this election. By the way, uh, I voted on Tuesday. I had a mail-in ballot, which I forgot to mail in, so I had to carry it to the polls. So I did, uh, I checked, you know, went through all the first offices. I went through, uh, you know, commissioner, dog catcher, you know, all of the amendments, all of those little things, and then I got to vote for president. And I want, I want to just tell you right now who I voted for for president of the United States. And I know no pastor has ever done this in the history of this church. And I know that I probably should not tell you right now who I voted for. But I want you to know who I voted for. I'm just going to go out on a limb. I voted for nobody. Nobody. And the reason is because I'm a pastor of a church that has Democrats and Republicans and Green Party and Independents. And I believe as your pastor, I need to represent all members of the church. But I want to tell you how I felt after I voted for nobody. Totally at peace. Total contentment. It was not a binary decision. Neither plenty nor want. Now, whether you agree with my decision or not, not to vote, I want you to know I found a sense of contentment, and it isn't because I don't have strong opinions about things. And then I went home and, and yelled at the TV like everyone else does. <laughs> This coronavirus is a battle between plenty and want. On the one hand, people are saying, there's no problem, nothing, just carry on. There's nothing happening. It's, it's great. Everything's great in our country. And on the other hand, the, the world is going to end tomorrow. But the truth is in neither. Neither. But the point is what I'm trying to make is that our contentment is found in Christ. Our contentment, our enoughness in Christ. Churches experience this. I've only been pastor here for two and a half years, but in two and a half years, we've had lots of plenty, right? I mean, concerts, worship services, snow days, compassion care conferences. I mean, it has been a... Two and a half years of plenty, and it has been two and a half years of want. There's been some hardships, and there's been some difficulties. The key, however, is not to live in the land of want. You ever meet somebody like that? Nothing's ever going well. Nothing is ever going well. They, they bought real estate in the land of want. On the other hand, have you ever met somebody who just... They, they own, like, an entire island of plenty. But the key to contentment as a church 
is enoughness in Christ. It is centered on Christ. As we move forward together, we will have plenty and we will have want. Those of you who are married recognize the phrase plenty and in want. It's a part of our wedding vows. Sickness and health, plenty and want, till death do we part. And I know that not everybody here is, is married, but uh, surely you know people who are, and maybe you have been married, and maybe you want to be married, and maybe your spouse is in heaven. But, I mean, I love, I love weddings. The only wedding we've had in the church since I've been here is Stephanie and Lou. Thank you for taking one for the team. Thank you so much. <laughs> this is Stephanie and Lou in our chapel, such a beautiful couple. So wonderful. And we have another wedding coming up in May. Very exciting. And if anyone else wants to get married, just let me know. Let's, let's, just, let's just get it going here. But I love to talk to couples about marriage before they get into it. That's called premarital counseling. And the first question I always ask people is, do you know what you are getting into? <laughs> now, based on their answer to that question, I know how much chance the marriage has of success. Because if they come out and they go, oh yeah, we got this thing. We know exactly what we're getting into. It's usually the guy, by the way, who, who does that. <laughs> She's like, uh. But if the couple, on the other hand, says, you know what? We don't know what we're getting into. Help us to know what we're getting into. The reason couples don't know and how can they is because you know every couple getting into a marriage knows what plenty is right plenty of romance plenty of time plenty of money plenty of space plenty of friends it's great and by the way if a couple doesn't have plenty heading into a marriage that's also a concern you got to have plenty what they don't And how can they understand is the want part. The want part. When the job doesn't come through that you wanted and you've got to be with your spouse through that, the want part. When you were trying to have kids and you just try to have kids and you can't have kids and the want part. When one of them gets sick and you got to care for them and it's a daily struggle, the want part. When you don't know how to pay the bills and you're not sure how you're going to pay the bills, the want part. But again, the key to contentment is not either to live in the land of want or the land of plenty, but to find contentment in Christ. In Christ. One of my favorite movies of all time is not exactly a family movie. just want to say that at the start. But it was made in 1996 and it is the movie Fargo. I have watched this like 500 times. I love this movie. Now, it's a little violent, but by today's standards, by today's standards, it's probably PG, you know. Um, But the movie is about this cop, this police chief named Marge, Marge Gunderson. And Marge lives in Brainerd, Minnesota, you know. And she is trying to solve a crime, which is the basic part of the movie. But the real movie is about a series of relationships. And one of the key relationships is Marge Gunderson and her husband, Norm Gunderson. Now, Marge is so positive, so upbeat, she can find something positive in anything. Norm, on the other hand, is a bit of a downer, you know. Norm paints pictures of birds when he's not complaining about the world. My favorite scene, and a scene that I think just, it just oozes contentment, is the last scene. Norm has been painting and trying to get his, his bird approved by the U.S. government to put on a three cent, or to put on a stamp. So here are Marge and Norm Gunderson at the end of the movie. Norm. They announced it, you know. They, uh, they announced the, the stamp competition. Yeah, they announced it. They announced it, said Marge. Yeah, yeah, they announced it. 
So, well, who did they choose? Who did they choose, says Marge? Well, they chose me for the three-cent stamp. You mean you're Mallard? Yeah, the Mallard. That's terrific, Norm. That's fantastic. Yeah, but no one uses three-cent stamps. <laughs> sure they do, Norm. They do when they need three cents of a stamp. But they chose Hartman's blue wing teal for the 29 cent stamp. Oh, for Pete's sake, Norm, that's great. But then my favorite scene in the movie, there's a long pause and they put their arm around each other and, and, and Marge says, you know what, Norm? We're doing pretty well. We're doing pretty well in the midst of a chaotic, chaotic world. And that is contentment. When you can say, you know what? We're doing pretty well in Christ. Thank you, God. Thank you for being the ballast and the center of each of our lives. I pray that in this crazy world, you would help us who love you to find contentment in you. In your holy name we pray, amen.